The end of the American theater of the Seven Years' War, known in the United States as the French and Indian War in 1763, saw the end of New France and British North America gain much territory from the defeated French. This newfound territory north of the Ohio River wasn't very well known to the British public, even compared to Canada, which was still vague at the time. The outbreak of the French and Indian War put this region in the public consciousness, and one aspect that was alluring to the British public were the period maps which depicted the Great Lakes and extensive waterways of the region. This newfound public interest in the region did not prevent misconceptions from appearing such as the inaccurate cartography of the time and outdated population numbers which understated French inhabitation in the West. So great was this lack of knowledge, Clarence Alvord writes that a June 1763 map in the Gentleman's Magazine doesn't even include the Wabash River. For the British, they were indifferent to new acquisitions or skeptical of how beneficial they were for the British Empire. This is in contrast to the Americans who wholeheartedly supported expansion for their own monetary gain. Large tracts of America were added by the last year to the British dominions, but that they were at best only the barren parts of the continent, the refuse of the earlier adventurers which the French, who came last, had taken only as better than nothing. Land speculation arose in Great Britain soon after the English Civil War, and soon became influential. Intruding itself into the affairs of state, it soon taught politicians that they must shape their policies by its needs, so that by the middle of the 18th century, there had developed an alliance between big business and the governing class which fostered a political immorality that resembled in its salient characteristics the similar phenomenon which has shown itself so plainly in the United States. Naturally, this enterprise would have its influence in the American colonies as well. Now, prominent Virginians alongside wealthy British financiers founded the Ohio Company in 1747 and they would get 500 acres on the upper Ohio River. Now, the Ohio Company would receive more grants over time. The Virginia colony itself would give grants over the years and by 1757, Virginia granted over 2 million acres west of the Alleghenies. Grants increased during the outbreak of the French and Indian War in order to incentivize recruitment for colonial troops. Now, many of these grants and sessions were given on the condition that the Ohio Company, or new owner, would settle the region with families. These moves to cement Virginia's control over the vast west was not unnoticed by the other American colonies. They did not want such a valuable territory to be under the control of one single colony. Having independent colonies in the territories was seen as a way to limit Virginia's territorial claims. Philadelphia was a hotbed of antagonism towards Virginia, very much interested in the vast West for their own sake. Benjamin Franklin himself proposed in the 1754 Albany Conference the establishment of new colonies. Benjamin Franklin wrote shortly after proposing the establishment of two colonies in the West between the Ohio River and Lake Erie. Benjamin Franklin believed that this would secure the frontier against the French and their machinations, and to prevent a dreaded union between the French colonies in Louisiana and Canada. Now, Virginia wasn't the only colony to claim parts of the West in Ohio. As you can see in this map, the colonies had very strange overlapping borders the source of many conflicts. The Western Connecticut Reserve being a particularly peculiar one in my opinion. New York land speculators prepared for the creation of a colony by the name of New Wales, in honor of the Prince of Wales, its would-be proprietor. The first advertisement for the colony was published in the New York paper. It was reprinted in the June 1763 edition of the Gentleman's Magazine. The Pennsylvania Gazette of April 21st, 1763 is even more detailed with the proposal, with 400,000 acres that would be sold to the proprietors at 50 pounds per 1,000 acres in order to fund the colony. It states that the number of families proposed to form the first settlement are 4,000, who are to march in two divisions and are to compose two cities or towns. They also state the colony's dimensions as 9 degrees of north latitude and 9 degrees of west latitude, beginning at the 9th degree from Philadelphia and ending at the 17th degree of western longitude 
latitude from 36 to 34. Despite the newspaper's advertisements and public interest, the colony never materialized. Benjamin Franklin later wrote to Peter Collinson over the then-failed colony stating, and I quote, The proposal of a colony to be called New Wales was made without authority and by weak heads and is accordingly come to nothing. An anonymous pamphlet was released in the autumn of 1763 in Edinburgh. The pamphlet titled The Expediency of Securing Our American Colonies by Settling the Country Adjoining the River Mississippi and the Country Upon the Ohio Considered argued for the creation of a colony in the Ohio River Valley for the many reasons that others have argued previously, to protect the other colonies from the French and the natives, and to securely obtain this vast and valuable land. This colony, the anonymous writer dubbed Charlatina in honor of Queen Charlotte, it would cover much of the modern-day Midwest. The pamphlet's author mentions how for the poor of Britain and Ireland, it would be an opportunity to no longer scrape by merely for subsistence. They also propose that the crowded debtor jails of Britain and Ireland could be relieved by sending them to colonize the land. Now, neither New Wales nor Charlatina would come to be the 14th colony. These colonial ambitions were fueled by the desire to counter the French and natives, but also to limit the expansion of pre-existing colonies. These proposals were, as Clarence Alvord wrote, were of an ephemeral character and scarcely left a ripple on the politics of the mother country. Any Western colony would be nipped in the bud by the Treaty of Paris of 1763, which ended the French and Indian War, or Seven Years' War. The treaty was great for the British, as it cemented their control over Canada and the Mississippi. For the Native Americans, it was horrible, as they could no longer play the French and British against each other for their own gain. While the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys were now British territory, the American colonists weren't permitted to settle past the Proclamation Line of 1763 to appease the Native Americans. Though this didn't stop colonists from settling past it. This alongside the fact that in 1776, the territory north of the Ohio River would be ceded to the French and Catholic province of Quebec showed how British and American interests, once united by the war, were split apart by the peace. This especially aggravated Virginia's elite, as they claimed much western territory, which was now Quebecois land or native reserves. For the American colonists, these developments were seen as a betrayal by the British monarchy, which would contribute to diverging interests and eventually American independence. It is interesting to see a glimpse of the political and economic dynamics that both the British and Americans had while under a single nation, when those in Great Britain and on the continent were driven by common interests, as seen in the Edinburgh pamphlet for how short-lived that was. <laughs>